Hi Rali, hi, hi. nice to meet you. Yeah. Shall I leave my shoes just here? I'm Rali, um, Rali Angelova. Um, I'm 33 year old and I work as a rehabilitation assistant in a local hospice. I have two little boys, um, a boy of two years and uh, another boy of four months and a husband. And when did you move into Citizen's House? Uh, we moved on the 20th of January this year, 2023. So quite recently. Yeah. yeah. And um, how, how have you found it so far? We have found it amazing. Um, it's like living a bit in a dream. It's an amazing feeling. It's an amazing feeling to, to live here. Raleigh and her family have recently bought and moved into their very first home in South East London. With ever escalating house prices, this is an out of reach dream for many people in the capital and other parts of the country. But Citizens House is a genuinely and permanently affordable housing project, newly developed by the not for profit London Community Land Trust. More about them later. The question is, what hope is there for other would-be homeowners in a housing market where, until recently, rising prices seemed unstoppable? Welcome to LSEIQ, the podcast where we ask social scientists and other experts to answer one intelligent question. I'm Sue Windybank from the IQ team, where we work with academics to bring you their latest research and ideas, and talk to people affected by the issues we explore. In this episode, I ask, how can we make homes more affordable? I'll hear how a protected viewing corridor established in the early 1700s prevents high-rise buildings from being built on some of the most valuable land in London. I'll speak to experts who challenge the idea that the green belts surrounding our major cities should never be built on. And I'll talk to the Executive Director of London Community Land Trust, which is delivering genuinely affordable housing with the support of local communities. First, I spoke to Christian Hilber, a Professor of Economic Geography at LSE, an expert in urban and real estate economics. There's a lot of discussion around about housing being unaffordable, but what does that actually mean? So how so if the price to income ratio is below three or at three, we typically consider that to be affordable for a person or a household. Um, if it's above three, it becomes increasingly unaffordable. If we look at England, it, it doesn't look good. Uh, if we look at London, the price to income multiple is, cl is close to 11 right now. And even if we look at the most affordable region in the country, which is the north, uh, the uh, price to income ratio is still close to five, slightly under five. Let that sink in. Houses are considered affordable if average prices are no more than three times average salaries. According to the Office for National Statistics, in England and Wales in the tax year ending in 2022, the median annual earnings for someone on a full-time salary was £33,000. This would mean an affordable home would be £99,000. Instead, the median house price was £267,500. I think we can see the problem here. Another way to look at affordability is to look at mortgage payments as a percentage of income, which of course is greatly affected by interest rates, an issue of concern to many right now. If you take into account the mortgage costs, housing affordability has um, deteriorated massively in, in London and in the UK. So just to give you some numbers, um, if you look at the first time buyer mortgage payments as a percentage of the take home pay. This was um, in London, it was 21% in 1995, and today it is 56%. And even if you take the country as a whole, the affordability has been exactly half as much uh, today than in 1995. So 
it um, a first time buyer spends seventeen percent of their take home pay on a mortgage in 1995 and today it's 34 percent. And what's driving this? Why has housing become so unaffordable? In a nutshell, it's demand and supply. So it's a combination of growing demand, which is mainly driven by rising real incomes um, and to a lesser extent by population growth. So that drives demand for housing. And this is in conjunction with on what we call unresponsive supply. Essentially, we need to build more homes. But as Christian explains, there are many obstacles to achieving this. Let me first talk about the regulatory constraints because I think in this country, those are the main constraints. So in England, the large cities are surrounded by green belts. What this means is it's not what you might think of what a green belt is. It's not the public parks that we love and where we go to on the weekends to take a rest. Um, It's a massive area of land surrounding the big city. So if we look at London, the London green belt is 3.3 times the size of the Greater London Authority. So it's absolutely massive, 514,000 hectares. And 22% of the Greater London Authority itself is Greenbelt land. For Christian, large areas of Greenbelt land around London and other major cities have little environmental or aesthetic value. Instead, these are often areas of intensive agriculture. And without reform, the Greenbelt will retain a stranglehold on development. And consequently, house prices will continue to remain high and increase. What the implication is, cities in England, they can't grow horizontally. They can't grow outwards. Like what many American cities do, they grow outwards. The British cities can't do that because of these green belts. But then that's not the only constraints. There are also height restrictions and view corridors that prevent how tall you can build. And some of these um, restrictions are quite extreme. Let me give you one example. So we have a view corridor to St. Paul's Cathedral from uh, King Henry VIII's Mount, that's in Richmond Park. This is 16 kilometers away from St. Paul's Cathedral. So there is a, how do you say, a, a looking glass where you can look through and on a good weather day, you can actually see St. Paul's Cathedral. But the trouble is you can't build anything that obstructs this view from King Henry VIII's Mount to St. Paul's Cathedral. We are talking probably the most expensive commercial real estate in Europe where you can't build tall buildings because of this view corridor. And this was established in 1710 when St. Paul's Cathedral was the tallest building in Europe. And the third type of constraints is is preservation policies, so conservation areas or um, listed buildings. So particularly in central areas, like in central London, there, there are lots of conservation areas. You can't knock down buildings and rebuild at a higher density. And if cities can't grow in either direction and you can't, you know, knock down and rebuild, then that can only go into prices. And, and that's what's going on in, in London and in, in Oxford and in Cambridge and in, in, in other places. Christian also points out that the tax system makes permitting development unattractive for local authorities, both financially and politically. In England, local authorities are the decision makers whether to permit a larger or a smaller uh, residential development project. So if, if a local authority permits a larger development project, they have you know, most of the costs, they have to provide the infrastructure. Perhaps if you have you know, lots of new houses, you, the schools get crowded, the school catchment areas shrink. You may have to provide an additional school class roads become more congested. These are all costs to the local authority and the residents of the local authorities who elect the local politicians. However, there are virtually no benefits from permitting development. So there is a council tax, but the council tax does not uh, compensate for the costs. And this is a major issue that local authorities 
not only face NIMBY residents, like not in my backyard residents who do not want uh, development in their backyard. And so it's not surprising that local authorities in England permit so little housing. Even with these constraints on development driving up house prices, there's an issue that I've often wondered about. I think a lot of people don't understand. Where does the money come from, though? Because wages haven't kept up with house prices at all. And yet there seems to me no ceiling to which houses won't go beyond. What's going on there? Yes, I would argue that's in in large parts driven by sorting of high-income households into these superstar cities like London. That, you know, highly productive people and wealthy people move into these cities. And this, because this is a global market, then this can go on for a very long time. If wages increase, prices might increase, but that doesn't make housing more unaffordable. So if you can't add new housing and it's a desirable location, this pushes up prices and rents. High house prices inevitably keep people in rented accommodation and put pressure on both the privately rented and social housing sector. Wanting to understand more about this, I spoke to Kath Scanlon, Distinguished Policy Fellow in the Research Unit, LSE London, who does a lot of work on housing policy. What proportion of people in the UK live in rented accommodation? In rented accommodation overall, it it would be about 40%, and about half of that would be social rented, and about half of that private rented. It's higher in London, it's about 25% in London, in the private rented sector. And post-COVID, we've seen um, really rapidly rising rental rates, particularly in London, but across the whole country. What's driving that? Demand for private renting is up if you look over the long term, because migration to this country is strong, despite the government's efforts, because households are smaller uh, than they were, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. Lots of people would rather live Uh, singly or in couples Um, and that demand in terms of more households from whatever source we have not kept up with it in terms of building enough new housing for those people to live in so that's behind the affordability issues across the board in housing there's more more demand and not enough supply in the private rented sector specifically um There are a few things that could be going on. People are living in the private rented sector for longer and some of them for their whole lives. So the turnover is slower than it used to be. So that means really what you're interested in in a market situation um, where you're trying to look at the prices is not uh, how many people live in this kind of accommodation, but what's happening with vacancies because that's where the prices are set. So if people are staying longer, uh, they're not leaving their flats, and so there's not an empty flat to fill. So it means that the the number that are empty is reduced, and that drives the prices up. It could also be that landlords are getting out of the sector because there have been a lot of changes in the taxation of landlords and tighter regulation of landlords. And would rent controls make any difference? Rent controls are always an attractive option to um, deal with affordability issues in the private rented sector. And the mayor of London has called for the power to be able to put in rent controls in London. They would help the people who are currently living in expensive private rented housing. They would mean more landlords would be likely to get out. And they would make it more difficult for people who are looking for somewhere to live. So they would definitely help some people, definitely hurt other people. Properly designed rent regulation can work for both landlords and tenants, but it has to be very carefully done. What role does the lack of social housing play in the rising cost of housing in the UK? If you look internationally uh, across all developed countries, England has a social housing sector that's about 19% of the stock. That's smaller, far smaller than a country like the Netherlands, which has the biggest um, social housing stock at about a third of the homes, but way more than in the States where um, 
public housing accounts for probably 5% of, of all homes. So it's, it's broadly in line with, with the amount of social housing that a lot of developed countries provide. However, it's less than we used to have um, because of the right to buy. The number of council homes has been in decline since Margaret Thatcher's government introduced right to buy legislation in 1980. This allows most local authority housing tenants the power to buy their homes at a deeply discounted rate. In 1970, there were 5.5 million homes available for social rent in England. By 2021, this had fallen to 4.1 million, a reduction of 24%. Back to Kath. As I said before, what matters is is what's happening at the margin, what, what's, what's happening with the vacancies. There's very, very low turnover in social housing. And the tenants, once they get a tenancy, it's a tenancy for life, which is fantastic in terms of stability and, and building a home in a neighborhood. But it also means that vacancies are few and, and far between. And we are not building enough social housing to replace what was lost through the right to buy. And so that puts increased pressure on the private rental market, presumably. It does. It puts pressure on the on just the availability of homes. And there's also a mismatch, really, between the kind of housing that's available in, in the private rented sector and the kinds of homes that are needed. Uh, there's a mismatch in terms of the affordability because the rents are often higher than what benefit will pay for. But there's also a mismatch in terms of the the types of homes themselves. You get a lot of families living in overcrowded accommodation or unsuitable homes, people with small children that don't have any access to the outside or to play spaces. You're listening to LSEIQ. In this episode, I'm exploring how we can make housing more affordable. Christian and Kath have highlighted some of the pressures on house prices. However, Against this rather depressing backdrop, there are some interesting projects trying to help ordinary people with jobs into their own homes. I spoke to Oliver Bullid, Executive Director of the London Community Land Trust, the organisation behind Raleigh's home at Citizens House. In terms of what we do as, as London Community Land Trust, we, we work with communities um, to find sites, to lobby politicians, um, to raise funds and to then co-design and co-deliver community-led housing on a, on a range of sites around London. London Community Land Trust works with teams of local people to campaign and bid for land in their boroughs. This is often local authority or other public land that is being underutilised. For example, Citizen's House was built on some garages next to a social housing estate which had attracted some antisocial behaviour. Of course, land makes up a large part of the expense of building in London and the London Community Land Trust also receives substantial grant support from the Greater London Authority which enables it to essentially subsidise its homes. The price of our homes are are linked to average salaries for the area and, and that's available through... Uh, Office of National Statistics data every year. So each borough has a slightly different average median income. Um, And then we apply a a multiplier in terms of a mortgage and and also a a multiplier in terms of the size of the home. And and, and what that means is that the home is then genuinely affordable for someone on an average salary. So typically what we try and do is is make a one-bedroom home available for one average income for that area so that one person can afford to buy a one bedroom flat up to a four bedroom home which would be two times average salaries for the area so that two average salaries could afford a a four bedroom home uh, and with the other homes priced to in between and then if the homes are sold they're resold on the same basis and what kind of demand have you seen for your houses for our Lewisham project at Citizens House, we had, I think, over a thousand expressions of interest for the 11 homes um, and over 400 applications. Um, So pretty substantial. Um, And I suppose that's a clear demonstration that that there is, uh, well, as we all know, a desperate housing need. 
Raleigh was lucky enough to be selected to be able to buy a two-bedroom flat on the development. As part of this, she and her husband had to demonstrate, amongst other things, their commitment to the local community. It was a thorough process, in fact. Um, There was um, an application form, very detailed one. We needed to complete and provide lots of evidence. Um, The criteria was quite clear. You need to think how this criteria applies to your own life, you know, in terms of uh, having um, some sort of connection with Lucium, with the bar of Lucium, you know, either having lived here with us. It was my husband who lived in Lucium uh, previously and uh, me working in Lucium. and so, so yeah, so this is how, how we met the criteria. Uh, and what's your experience of um, renting in London been like? It's been really hard because when, when we, you know, reflect on our budget and, you know, on our savings, um, at least one salary goes just to rent and bills even even one of our salaries could not fully cover the rent and the bills that went with it so i mean from what i knew our salaries were you know probably average salaries um you know which kept us going you know able to pay high rent um and all our bills and have a bit of savings um you know savings even enough to get a deposit but these salaries were not enough for a bank to approve us as, as you know, as someone who they could um, lend money to. So, so when we applied for this particular scheme, basically the bank said that the highest amount that they could lend us was 242,000. The flat was 272,000. <laughs> this is my boy. <laughs> Practicing his ukulele. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, 240,000 is, it's not yeah. nothing, is it? it no, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of borrowed, money still, but, but, but I mean, we, it's not enough to buy something decent. Um, and yeah, it's not enough. I mean, and, and even with this scheme, you know, we, we were still told that we were at the top of our affordability even for this game. Would you say um, your new home has changed your life? Oh, for sure. I mean, we moved here at the period where we were totally exhausted. I mean, mentally, physically, having (laughs) a a second boy. And he was, when we moved here, he was um, just two months. And we were really exhausted. In the middle of this total exhaustion, physical, mental, from the moment we moved in and we knew, wow, no more wasting money on rent, you know, we are now paying back our own home, our first own home. It was just an amazing feeling. I mean, you know, that feeling kind of changes your brain chemistry. I mean, you're, you're more stable immediately. I asked Oliver about the long-term viability of housing provided by community land trusts. I think councils and others, you know, looking at, at in terms of climate crisis uh, and in terms of broader in, environmental issues, I think they're slowly coming around to the idea that, that actually development can be seen as part of a circular economy where we look at our community assets in the round uh, and we see that, well, really we're just stewards in the long term and, and we have to maintain some sort of community ownership and some sort of community stewardship of our public assets. I think community land trusts have a, a key part to play in, in that role of thinking about the development process as, a, as part of a, a circular economy process, not just a kind of a, a linear um, extract, um, produce, and, and then you're left with nothing. More housing developed by community land trusts is an exciting prospect. It is, however, only ever likely to provide a small part of the puzzle when addressing the housing affordability crisis. I asked Christian Hilber how house prices could be addressed more broadly, 
But first, I wanted to ask about an issue that is on many buyers' minds right now. We're recording this in February um, 2023, and there's been a lot of talk about a potential housing crash. Um, although some, there seems to be some debate about whether it will just be more of a decline or stabilisation in prices. Um, but is that what first-time buyers need to get on the housing market? Would a house price crash achieve that for them? Unfortunately, the answer is no, it, it won't help them. So to summarise it, unfortunately, this house price bust or possibly crash are not going to help most young would-be buyers because their re- real incomes are falling and that's the reason why the prices in, uh, fall in the first place and interest rates are rising, meaning higher mortgage costs. So the only people who, for whom housing really becomes more affordable is those who don't need to finance their housing with mortgages. How can we make housing more affordable? What we need is a planning system that focuses on correcting market failures, that is rule-based, doesn't create uncertainties. So what I have in mind is like rather a rule-based zoning system rather than the, you know, the development control system that creates a lot of uncertainty and focuses on urban containment that we currently have uh, in place. The UK operates a development control system which is geared towards containing development. It stipulates that any change of use of any parcel of land requires permission to be granted by local planning authorities. This sparks a consultation process that gives significant weight to pressures from local opposition. This is in contrast to a rule-based zoning system used by most of the rest of the developed world. This front loads many decisions by prescribing the types of development allowed in a particular area and reduces the need for planning judgments to be made and therefore room for opposition. Along with planning reform, Christian also advocates changes in tax to create incentives for development. What I have in mind, for example, is to have a meaningful local property tax at the local authority level where you actually allow local authorities to reap the benefits of residential development so in so they can actually fund these local public services they can you know where the money helps maintaining the roads providing you know good schools etc etc where there are some incentives for local authorities to actually permit development otherwise um vote for political change you know vote for meaningful reform to get house building going because the problem is that in the 1970s we built roughly twice as many housing units that that we build today. Kath Scanlon agrees with Christian's assessment of the Greenbelt and how it constrains the expansion of London. In particular, she highlights proposals to build around train stations. We have to be realistic about how affordable housing can ever be in London or in England, given the constraints that that there are and the demand pressures. The population of London is going from 6.8 million at the 1991 census to projected to be more than 10 million in 2030, but the footprint can't go out because of the green belt. So we've got to, oops, sorry. So we've got to build up, that's expensive. We're building more, that will help. We could relax restrictions on the green belt and allow for densification around the existing transport stations in the Greenbelt, of which there are a lot. There are a lot of train stations in the Greenbelt that serve little tiny villages and it's not allowed to build any more housing around them. I think it would make sense to allow that. In a report for the think tank Centre for Cities, LSE academic Paul Cheshire recommended releasing for development almost all Greenbelt or agricultural land within 800 metres of any station, which have a service of 45 minutes or less to a major city. The report says that this could provide the space to build more than 2 million new homes with fast connections into many of Britain's largest cities. 
Finally, I asked Oliver Bullitt from London Community Land Trust what he sees as key to tackling the affordability crisis in housing. I think by local authorities and other holders of land to open up to the potential of community-led development and to see that as an additionality to the housing shortage. It's probably worth remembering that the current government did have a target of 300,000 homes per year. We haven't achieved that in recent history. I think we got close to 200,000 homes per year in around about 2019. Historically, we've only ever built um, the number of homes needed with substantial intervention by the state, building large-scale housing in in the 1960s and, and earlier and later. And so I think we can't rely on the private sector to deliver the number of homes we needed. So we do need to build more homes. We need to use all the tools that we have and I think the community involvement and groups like ourselves I think is a win-win all around. I can genuinely see this our model and other community land trusts going from strength to strength but but it will need central government support and it will need grant funding uh, and unfortunately that central government support is lacking um, and hasn't been renewed. Uh, we've had I think it's six housing ministers in the last 12 months Um, So it's sad that there isn't a continuity of central government um, support in in that role. Uh, And I think it needs to be taken really, really seriously by government because um, it's a a really complex problem that can't be solved. We're we're part of the solution, but we're not going to fix it on our own. This episode was produced by me, Sue Windybank, and edited by Oliver Johnson. If you'd like to find out more about the research in this episode, head to the show notes. And if you enjoy IQ, please leave us a review. Coming next on LSEIQ, James Ritty asks, what's it like to be an animal?